Hello everyone. Welcome back to the second session of today on academic opportunities after the PhD. Just waiting for the meeting to fill up. Uh, give everyone a few more minutes. I've just put a little note in the chat. If you would like to tweet about today's event, please use the hashtag ECR Day 2021. And if you're sharing uh, an image of anyone's slides, please make sure to tag or cite them. I think Sophie Cooper, who is assisting with the technology, will be putting people's uh, Twitter handles in the chat function so you can find them and uh, tag them accordingly. We had some great slides in the last presentation. Um, also, just to let you know that this meeting is being recorded, um, you should make it available online afterwards. It'll probably go both on my website and on the Queen's University Postdoctoral Centre's website too. And all speakers will get a copy of the video as well for you know, future promotion purposes. <laughs> um, well, well, it was five past, so let's just get started. Um, hello, everyone. You're really welcome to today's event, uh, Academic Opportunities After the PhD. And this is our uh, second panel of the day. Today we're going to be talking about applications for fellowships with uh, Marie Curie, the Wellcome Trust and the Irish Research Council Enterprise Scheme. And I'm joined by Katie Mishler, uh, Deletta de Cristofaro and Anna Pills. I've got a few housekeeping things to go through again, so apologies if you've all heard this before in the, in the previous session, but we are being recorded, as I just let you know. Um, the speakers will present in the order listed on the programme, so Anna will go first, then Delatter, then Katie. I'll introduce each speaker before they talk, and then we'll have questions at the end. Please use the Q&A function, um, which is in the bottom of your bar down there, um, rather than the chat function. This just makes it easier for us to have all the questions in one place. Um, but if you do have any technical problems, you can use the chat function to report them to us. And Sophie Cooper is very kindly assisting with the tech for this session. Um, and again, the note about if you'd like to tweet, please do. The hashtag's in the chat box, but please make sure to cite everyone. And I'd like to thank Sophie for her assistance with the, with the technology. Um, and also for Queen's University Belfast and the UKRI for making some funding available to pay today's speakers. Um, so without any further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. Um, Anna Pills, who is based at the University of Edinburgh, where she's a Marie Curie Fellow. Um, and she is in the School of Literatures, Languages and Cultures um, uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, to date, she has published in the field of Irish studies with a particular specialism in women's writing, cultural history and literary history, as well as on the intersection between literature uh, and environmental history. So I'd like to pass over to Anna. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, I'm going to share my screen in the hope that this will work. Um, bear with me. Are we, does that work all right? Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so thanks very much, Alison, for bringing us together in this virtual space. I very much enjoyed this morning session. And um, I will be talking today about the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions. Um, and just as a precursor, I won't do an introduction to the scheme as such. I will obviously give some details as to what possibilities there are under this funding scheme. But overall, um, my focus will be on my experience of applying and uh, going a little bit into the nitty gritty detail of um, the proposal um, itself. Um, writing grant applications, as uh, we all know, is always um, very time consuming. Um, but we can all learn as we go along. So I don't think that any application written um, or proposal is, is, is a waste of time, no whether it's successful or not. And I've certainly learned a lot um, through this. And I will be drawing on my experience of applying to Marie Curie twice. Um, I was unsuccessful on the first submission and successful on the second. 
And um, today I will be structuring my discussion a little bit around um, what my CV looked like at the time of application, why I chose to apply to this particular scheme and what it had to offer, um, how I approached this grant application when I first applied. So going a little bit through the process, um, some of the key changes I made based on the feedback I received on the first application for the resubmission, and then sum up by giving you some kind of lessons learned um, that I wish I had known before um, and that you hopefully find helpful as you're writing up your own grant application, whether it's for the Marie Curie scheme um, or indeed any other. Um, so also I would like to point out I applied to Marie Curie in 2018 um, when it was still operating under Horizon 2020. Now uh, the European Commission has a new uh, funding tenure and it's uh, under Horizon Europe. Um, so the call structure when the call opens and the deadline for submission is slightly different. Um, they also changed their kind of terminology about some of the schemes. So I held an individual follow fellowship. Now it's become a postdoctoral fellowship and they have also changed some of the eligibility criteria. Um, I would strongly um, encourage you to check out um, the European Commission's web portal where you can find all information for this call. Um, just as a brief summary I've outlined here, so this is for applicants from any discipline. Um, at the point of application, you should have a PhD um, and no more than eight years of experience from the date of the PhD awarded. And um, this of course comes with certain exceptions and um, such as career breaks and you can look up whether that is applicable to you. Um, and there is the famous mobility role to Marie Curie schemes. It's really a funding scheme um, that puts an emphasis on mobility and on training and gaining new skills. And um, you can choose your host institution and the host institution cannot be in a country where you have spent more than 12 months in the preceding three years. Um, opportunities you have um, are for either a European fellowship um, or a global fellowship. Um, so depending what suits best your needs at a given point in time, um, that's, that's your remit. Um, so please uh, check out the current, the current call um, and my experience will relate to the previous call. Um, so I applied first in 2018 and at that time my CV already demonstrated quite a lot of mobility. I'm originally from Germany where I am um, did my undergraduate studies and cultural studies and then went on to a master's and PhD degree um, in the UK at the University of Liverpool and I um, hold a PhD from 2018 so um, I'm now also no longer um, early career uh, really um, depending on where you are and what the definitions are. Um, and I had um, an Irish Research Council postdoc that brought me to Ireland uh, for two years between 2014 and 2016. Um, so I've kind of moved around these three countries. Um, I had teaching experience from different institutions in the UK and Irish um, higher education system. And I had already, like Sarah and Anne, Annie, uh, who talked this morning, some experience um, or kind of a, a funding record that I started to accumulate already during my PhD. Um, I had a fees only award for my PhD and then topped it up by continuously applying for small grants that would help me to conduct research uh, um, at archives abroad, um, in particular in the USA. Um, I applied for conference scholarships that would enable me to disseminate my research findings and gain feedback. Um, and during my postdoc uh, in Ireland, I applied for funding to organize um, a workshop. So I had a kind of gradually increasing um, track record. And um, when I was in 2018, I found myself in Ireland. Um, I had been um, part time teaching at University College Cork um, and did some writing sessions uh, with the Skills Centre at the Library of University College Cork. Um, and was unemployed for a while and wasn't quite sure where my academic trajectory is going to go. Um, I was applying at the time for lectureships, for funding, as well as for research support roles in um, academic administration. 
In early 2018, then I received news that I was awarded a short term fellowship at the Institute for Advanced um, Studies in the Humanities at the University of Edinburgh. And um, in kind of a couple of months later, I got a positive response for a fellowship application to go to the Rachel Carson Center at LMU in Munich. Um, so I felt like I was maybe gaining a little bit of traction and there was wind back in my sails and I thought maybe I'll use the time and try one more time um, and write um, a Marie Curie grant application. Um, I had published my doctoral thesis um, in the form of a couple of like in book chapters and a couple of articles. I had published one co-edited collection of essays and had two commissioned chapters that were in progress for um, kind of landmark publications in the field with prestigious publishers. And I had one other co-written article under review. So the publication record was kind of forming with things already out there with a few things um, in the works. And I had a book contract for my first monograph, which um, will be based on uh, my first postdoc project. And I really was kind of looking for a position um, for myself that would give me a salary um, for a second postdoc project um, that would lead me to gain a little bit of new knowledge. So having started out with kind of Irish studies and the focus on Irish literature, I wanted to expand into a comparative field um, and wanted to do work on Scottish literature and cultural geography while developing my profile in environmental humanities. I was also quite interested in learning kind of new skills um, on an intersectoral level through engagement with stakeholders in heritage and tourism um, and to develop a funding and publication profile that would allow me then to apply for a larger research grant application that would give me a little bit more of a stable uh, post for a period of four or five years. Um, and Marie Curie was for me one of the uh, not only remaining options, but one of the very few, uh, because I was already five years post PhD, um, I was no longer eligible for Leverhulme or the AHRC, um, two of the key UK uh, based funding schemes. Um, and my profile wasn't developed enough for an ERC starting grant because I hadn't turned my thesis into a book. Um, uh, or at least that was that was the advice at the time. Um, so Marie Curie, um, offers you uh, to develop your own research project. It gives you a great kind of freedom in choosing where you want to be, be based um, if you take the mobility um, eligibility into account. Um, it has a focus on training and developing new skills. It has a very generous research budget um, that includes um, a mobility allowance, so assisting you in relocating to your host institution. It has um, a generous family allowance um, if you are in that position. Um, and it comes with a very generous research budget that allows you to, um, you know, do events, bring people together, uh, do artist commissions, um, or kind of think a little bit more creatively. And you have the opportunity to include an academic or non-academic secondment and under Horizon Europe there is now also the possibility for a six-month placement um, if you are interested in in that. Um, so how then the key issue then is where would you go finding a host institution um, which is obviously determined by the location where do you want to be um the network that you have access to and the network of your kind of research field as in where are the hubs um where you can kind of make a good case why that project would belong to that um and also to kind of be open to opportunities that are out there so for instance you can check the euraccess um web pages and marie curie postdoctoral fellowships um are are for instance listed by institutions where they're um actively recruiting potential applicants. So as I said, the current call is open. So do have a look um, and you can kind of uh, define the, the search terms a little bit and you can either look by country or look for a particular um, um, particular institutions or particular fields and see whether something comes up um, that you can respond to. So the location um, has a lot to do with where do you want to be, where can you be? Um, initially, I was looking to apply for a global fellowship scheme, 
um, which would have been a three year period of two years outgoing to either the US, uh, New Zealand or Australia, and then returning for a third year to Europe, which would have allowed me to remain in Ireland. Um, that would, would have been the only option under the mobility rule I would have had to leave Ireland. Um, and in the end, I decided that um, I'm not prepared for family reasons to um, move to the US and decided for a European fellowship and eventually found that I'd been out of the UK for long enough. And with the comparative approach that I wanted to take with Ireland and Scotland, um, I looked to a university in Scotland and to an expert in the time period I wanted to study and in Scottish literature and wrote an email with a pitch for the project and asked would you be interested in developing this project with me and um, Professor Pennyfielding thankfully said yes and um, that was kind of then settling settling on the host institution and drawing on kind of like a network and going with that uh, forward. In terms of the timeline back in 2018 the call for Marie Curie usually opened in April um, and then there is a whole host of introductory sessions and webinars and workshops where you can um, learn about the scheme, what it entails, the application process, uh, etc. And some universities also host particular writing workshops for applicants. Um, these operate uh, based on an application process again. So the Catholic University in Leuven in Belgium, for instance, um, they host workshops that you have to apply to. Um, and it's quite, it's quite crucial that you are aware where you want to go and what opportunities uh, and help is available at the host institution and be aware of any internal deadlines. So once I had secured my mentor, um, and was sure which host institution I would apply through. Um, Edinburgh had an internal deadline where they evaluate, are you a good fit for this university? Is it a good fit with the mentor? And if they do go ahead with the application, you get research support. Um, so you can see the timeline there. Um, so I had secured the mentor in early May and then was starting to develop the project and the draft proposal over June and July. Um, to have the application ready in early August for internal review. Um, the application went forward and with support from the research office um, and kind of working together with the mentor, I revised the application and submitted it in early September. And the outcome was communicated in February 2019. Um, to talk a little bit about the application process. So um, it's a very unwieldy, um, technically specific form. Um, here you see, for instance, um, the requirements um, for the core of the proposal that makes up 10 pages. So you have to address three key criteria um, for excellence, impact and implementation. And each of these have subcategories where they tell you what you should put in. And you can see here, I hope, although it's a little bit uh, small in font, um, I apologize, it tells you quite specifically what information you need to put in. So of those 10 pages, um, it's almost every sentence is almost predetermined. You just have to fill it with the right information based on your project. Um, and the research plan and the jargon that comes with this particular one um, can be quite heavy. And it's important that you familiarize yourself um, with all the kind of guidelines and handbook and the terminology early on. So Maris Klodowski Curie actions, the action in this case is the project and your project should have a set of research objectives um, that will be addressed in a series of work packages, which in turn have sub objectives and tasks and the progress of these work packages will be measured via milestones that function as control points and the deliverables, which are your project outputs. So to give you a little example of this, um, so I applied to begin work on my second postdoc project, and this had to do with travel writing during the romantic period along Ireland and Scotland's Atlantic coastlines. And as a first step, I obviously needed to identify the corpus of text that I would be working with. So 
research objective was to recover a neglected body of travel texts. Um, and that would be done in work package one to identify what these texts are. And the subject objective would be to make sure that um, I address, or I wanted to look at both male as well as female travel writers. I wanted to make sure I have um, some kind of ethnic diversity. Uh, so I'm, for instance, looking uh, not only at Anglophone texts, but also at non-Anglophone texts uh, from travelers from Germany and from France. Um, and the tasks have to do with compiling a database where I list all the relevant texts. And this is then one of the kind of milestones of, say, work package one, um, to have this database that then is the input for work package two that forms the analysis of the travel texts. Um, so if I wanted to make that database available online for other scholars because it might be useful to them, that would then be also a project output or it can be um, an input for work package two and the analysis then would lead to journal articles, a virtual exhibition, which would then be project outputs. Um, so that gives you an idea and you have to visualize all of that in the form of a Gantt chart. Um, I think it was when I applied for the Irish Research Council in um, 2013 that I learned about Gantt charts for the very first time. Um, and I'm sure you might hear more about them later on. They essentially visualize the course of the project over its lifetime. Um, and you have the work packages and you can see the coding there. So if we look at work package one it has to do with project management, it runs throughout the two years um, and you have a deliverable um, which in this case is, for instance, um, a personal career development plan that will be reviewed every six months. Um, so thus you have D1.1, D1.2, etc. And what these individual deliverables are is listed in your, um, is listed in the kind of prose of your proposal where you outline what each kind of project, what each work package includes in terms of its objectives and tasks, etc. Um, so I th I'm sharing this because it can be quite useful or kind of helpful to see what Gantt charts might look like. They can take different forms. Um, you just need to find what, what fits best. Um, and it gives you a good visual to see, do you have clusters of activity or is it spread out quite evenly across the two years? Do you have periods where absolutely nothing happens? Maybe you want to put in some activities there. Uh, so it really kind of helps you to visualize what the project might look like um, as it goes on. So um, as I said, I was unsuccessful with my first application and received a score of 90.6. You can see here the details um, of the scores and you can also see the weighting that each category is given. So excellent gets 50%, impact gets 30, implementation 20. Um, in your 10 page proposal, you want to make sure that you adhere the space you give to each of these sections in line with the weighting. So um, I would not recommend to write only two pages about on the excellence section, which is in essence um, the description of your research project, and eight pages to both impact and implementation because it wouldn't reflect the ratio. So my recommendation I think would be to have about five, five and a half pages that you dedicate to outlining the research project, the state of the art, the methodology, um, et cetera, and then have about two and a half pages, um, three pages for the impact and the rest for the implementation. So you don't really have a lot of wriggle room and you need to get a lot of information in there. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how you might be able to do that. Um, the good thing about the Marie Curie scheme is that you receive feedback and it can be quite detailed. Um, it lists your strengths and your weaknesses from um, two to three reviewers. And you can see here one of the, a couple of comments pertain to um, the methodology I wanted to employ in the project. They were questioning uh, using ArcGIS software. They weren't quite sure who will benefit from this and how this will be disseminated. Um, questions around sustainability. Um, that is a key theme in the project. And then those are kind of the more hefty 
content-based um, criticisms. And then you can see kind of more nitty gritty ones um, where it says that international networking opportunities at the institution not sufficiently explained. That can be done by a sentence, right? Um, so you need to kind of then see what kind of criticism did I get? Where do I need to put in most labor uh, to make changes? What can be easily fixed and where do I need to go back to the drawing board? Um, in terms of the research project, because another criticism was that I was a bit over ambitious, I actually took the whole ArcGIS software out because it enabled me to give more space to a different section. And I realized this has only to do with visualizing something. It's not part of an inquisitive mode um, or not part of like it doesn't change the research questions. Um, I scored lowest for the impact section um, in which three points are crucial. To what extent um, does the action enhance the future career of you as the researcher? Um, what kind of, what are, what is the impact um, of the proposed kind of activities and outputs um, of the whole project and how do you communicate what's the impact for the kind of wider audience particularly like non-academic audience um, this is what the feedback kind of looks like and i've highlighted to you uh, to show that sometimes reviewers comments can be a bit um contradictory shall we say so whereas strengths they point out that I did quite well in explaining how the project will be exploited and disseminated, that there is a clear um, description of what types of activities will be happening um, to make the project, you know, be um, intelligible um, for non-specialists. But it's also a weakness where it says the strategy for public dissemination needs to be considered in greater detail, who will be targeted and how. And um, Here's uh, the change. So this is the same section of the overall proposal. Um, on the left, you can see that initially I had this in prose format um, and was doing kind of like an ABC listing of how I would communicate the project activities to different audiences. And upon resubmission, I put this into a table format. Um, again, this is quite uh, small, I'm sorry, but I was trying to give you the visual um, that how it looks different. So in the table, I identified the target audience to whom did I want to communicate? How will that communication happen by giving indication about the communication means? So whether that is press articles, virtual exhibition or a workshop or meetings, and then gave a little bit more detail about the planned activities. Um, for the implementation, I got quite a high mark uh, upon first submission. The weaknesses were that I was a bit over ambitious. So make sure that you really don't over promise um, and really think carefully what is achievable within a two year time frame for this particular program. Um, and then this was uh, one of my favorite ones where they uh, say the proposal does not sufficiently describe the infrastructure, logistics and facilities offered on secondment. So I integrated um, an academic secondment with um, National University of Ireland Galway. And what this means, that weakness, is that I didn't have a sentence in there that I will have access to office space, IT and the library, etc. Um, so this is the kind of detail that they really want to see. And um, again, at the very, this was the last table I included in my 10 uh, page research program, um, I listed what services at each institution um, is being offered and how it feeds into the project. So I gave specifics as in what work packages are being supported by, say, the School of Languages, Literatures and Cultures, the Environmental um, Humanities Network, uh, the School of Geosciences and School of History, because I was kind of trying to bring geography and cultural geography into the project. Um, and then it goes down to relocation support, research support, finance support. So really think about every aspect of your project um, and of you moving to a new country and to a new institution. What support is available at the institution and how will it help you to implement the project? So I hope that these kind of give you a little bit um, exam like concrete examples, what, what the application might look like and how you might put information together. And I made small tweaks 
and the marginal gains were rooting then for success. So upon second application, I got 94% success rate. So you can see here that they really are marginal. Um, and I should also say that this really depends on who reads your application. I have also heard from people who received a very high mark upon first submission and actually received a lower grade um, upon second submission, um, although they addressed many of the issues um, that they received and that, that were mentioned in the feedback. So um, there is a lot of luck involved as well. Um, as to the lessons learned, um, what would I have done differently? I think I would have started a little bit earlier and put more energy into the early phase around April and May. So already starting writing out a proposal, um, writing an abstract and thinking about the breakdown of the work packages and think more about what activities I want. I came quite late in reaching out to potential secondment partners. And I think it would be hugely beneficial if, for instance, um, you knew you wanted to uh, go on secondment with a non-academic partner. You could, for instance, if you have the time in spring, organize a workshop bring those stakeholders into the room so that they get a sense of who you are, what your project and your research is about, so that you get some investment and build that connection. And that will then inform um, the whole application because you can ask them, you know, how would that research be of interest to them? What, what are they curious about uh, that you could bring to the table? So that it really becomes more a dialogue and um, that you can then get them to, uh, a agree to a secondment and write you a letter of support that you can attach to the application. Um, so those are the kind of the, the, that's one of the main things I would uh, I would change and that I wish I had known earlier. So yeah, the, the 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 top five I would say is to start as early as possible and get help and as much feedback as you can. Lean into the whole grant speak. So go with the whole flow of the work packages and the research objectives. Um, there is no point in um, trying to you know argue that this really is a grand scheme mainly for stem researchers and we as humanities scholars sometimes find it difficult to how do we make our um our projects or our outputs compatible with a tabular format try and lean in and try to kind of see that have a very clear narrative for the three p's which is project person place um so there really needs to be a strong coherence around that um, and it really needs to show that you're planning and in charge of your career trajectory. And last but not least, make it readable. Um, so it's a very compact proposal. You only have 10 pages and you really want to make sure that um, you make it as easy as possible for the reviewer because they're sitting there with a checklist and they go through and uh, make sure that you address all those aspects. And um, I think I've kind of outstayed my welcome already. Um, it's, uh, it's been, I've been talking for a long time. Um, I hope you found it useful and I'm happy to answer any questions and feel free to reach out if you want to have a chat about it in more detail. Thanks. Uh, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Anna, so much. So much to think about and so much great advice. I loved the uh, top tips at the end there. Um, next, we'll move on to Deletta. Uh, Deletta de Cristoforo, um, who is a research fellow at Northumbria University's Humanities Department. Uh, she writes about contemporary culture, crises, and the politics of time. She is the author of the contemporary post-apocalyptic novel, Critical Temporalities and the End of Times, which was published with Bloomsbury uh, in 2020. Her current research project, Writing the Sleep Crisis, um, is an analysis of representations of sleep and sleeplessness in contemporary culture and is funded by the Wellcome Trust and the European Commission. Today, uh, Deletta will be talking about her experience with the Wellcome Trust, but Deletta is, has also got a Marie Curie, um, so she might also address that uh, at certain points too. So uh, thank you very much, Deletta. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Alison, and good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, and I just wanted to start by thanking Alison again for um, her work on organizing this event. Um, 
So today I'll be mostly talking about my experience of applying for um, Wellcome Trust funding, but as Alison has anticipated, the project um, with which I won my Wellcome Trust Fellowship uh, was also awarded a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship. Um, I applied for both schemes at the very same time, so I'm going to say a little bit about that uh, process in a moment. Um, so while Anna has uh, talked so helpfully uh, about Marie Curie funding, I'll just briefly mention a few top tips uh, about this scheme too here and there, just because my experience might be slightly different uh, from Anna's and so I could perhaps offer something slightly um, different to our audience um, today. So uh, I just want to say that obviously I'm talking about my experience uh, of applying for this um, postdoctoral fellowship, the Wellcome Trust postdoctoral fellowship. So by no means I'm claiming to be an expert in this type of funding, but I'm hoping that um, reflecting back on my experience might um, help some of you. Um, and another caveat that I feel I have to make is that the fellowship I applied uh, for in 2019 and was awarded in 2020, which is the Research Fellowship in Humanities and Social Science, does not exist anymore. Uh, Welcome has very recently changed their research strategy. So uh, this year they launched entirely new funding schemes. Um, so as an early career scholar, you'll now be looking at the early career award. Um, and I think that the very first round uh, of this new award will open in uh, just a few days um, in August. So obviously I won't be able to go into the specifics of the application form, but I'll say a little bit about the peer review and interview process, uh, which seems to have stayed similar to what I underwent um, back in 2019, 2020. Um, so since uh, today's event looks at the various paths that early career researchers take after their PhD, I thought I'd start by briefly speaking about what my post-PhD years looked like. Um, so um, on the slide, you've got a timeline that I'll talk through, um, and it's between my Viva, which was in September 2015, and the news of my successful application for Wellcome Trust funding in early 2020. So in blue, um, there are teaching positions I held and in um, orange research postdoc applications, both successful and unsuccessful, uh, because of course, as it's often the case, there's a lot of unsuccessful applications behind successful ones. Um, I could have included actually a lot more of unsuccessful ones, um, but they were kind of small pot for funding or uh, visiting research positions abroad. So, and also the, the slide is limited. Um, so uh, there's just a few ones, but there were more. Um, so the first academic year after my Viva, um, I applied for two postdoctoral fellowships um, with a similar project that I actually never ended working on. And I'll say a little bit more about why that is the case in a moment. Um, so one was in Berlin. I was longlisted, but ultimately unsuccessful. And then I applied for a Leverhulme um, early career um, fellowship, um, the expression of interest stage, so the very initial stage. And I wasn't selected to be put um, forward. Um, in the following year, I had a teaching fellowship and a maternity cover lectureship. Um, and I applied for a research fellowship at the Harry Ransom Center. I was successful, but it was just a short stay, a month. Um, the following year, I uh, secured a teaching fellowship at the University of Birmingham for a year, but then it was renewed uh, for a second and third year. And while I was in this role, I applied for um, some um, so for a BA small grant to do some archival research, but that was also unsuccessful. So at the end of 2018, I started thinking about an entirely new research project. So a project that was quite a shift in terms of the research that I'd been doing. Um, and it's a project as Addison has anticipated um, about representations of sleep and specifically the idea of a sleep crisis in contemporary culture. So I decided um, to develop some postdoctoral applications in order to fund this project. Um, and I did that in the following year. Um, I applied for four schemes, um, two of which, uh, Marie Curie and Welcome, were successful. Before I say a little bit more about these applications, I just want to highlight that there's a gap of a few years between the first two postdoctoral applications uh, back in 2015, early 2016, um, on a project that, as I said, I never developed. And then the four postdoctoral applications um, in uh, late 2018, early 2019 19, about the sleep crisis. Um, and this gap takes me to the first important point I'd like to make today, which is that sometimes it takes a while to develop a good idea for a postdoctoral research project. 
So some people obviously have a clear sense of what comes next research-wise after the PhD because they might have an offshoot project out of their PhD research that they'd like to develop, and that's great. That wasn't the case for me, and it might not be the case for some of you. Um, so hopefully my experience will somewhat um, reassure you. So I felt like there was no obvious offshoot pro project out of my PhD that I wanted to develop, um, to develop. I pressured myself to come up with an original research project straight after my Viva because I felt that the narrative was that you had to come up with, you know, the next big project straight away to be successful. Um, and of course, this narrative is also reinforced systemically by eligibility criteria uh, for a lot of funding schemes. Um, so the idea that, you know, you can't be um, out of your PhD for longer than two or three years um, in many cases. And of course, there was also um, the economic pressure of um, having to find a way to support myself um, and my research. So I don't wish to minimize, obviously, how strong these pressures are, but I think it's important to acknowledge that developing a good research project that could lead to a successful funding bid does take time. And certainly this was um, the case for me. Because those two initial, that initial idea that I came up with, um, it was actually not a particularly exciting project um, for me. I wasn't enthused about it and it wasn't really that much of a great project either. So it took me quite a while to actually find an idea that I was really excited about and I wanted to develop. So what did my CV look like uh, when I came to apply for um, Wellcome Trust funding and Marie Curie funding? So precisely because I was a few years out of the PhD by the time I developed uh, the idea for my sleep crisis project, I had a good number of publications. So I had around uh, three peer review articles. Uh, one was forthcoming, three book chapters, and a monograph that was about to be publish, published. Um, and I also had edited two special issues. Now, I really do want to stress that obviously I'm no in no way suggesting that you need a monograph to secure postdoctoral funding um, or indeed a really high number of publications because of course funders do take into account where you're at in your career journey. But in my case I think that because I was moving to a very new area of research um, it really helped to be able to demonstrate that I had completed all I wanted to complete out of my PhD project. And so I was really ready to move on and do something completely different. So I didn't have to write, for instance, the monograph out of my PhD any longer. Um, I also had um, research experience across the humanities. Um, so my background is in philosophy. My PhD is in American studies, which is quite um, an interdisciplinary field. I mostly work on contemporary culture, so across um, literature, films, and digital culture. And this was particularly important because the, um, my research project um, is quite interdisciplinary. Um, and I had to demonstrate that I could do that kind of interdisciplinary research. And also, I wanted to show that I was ready to actually take that interdisciplinarity further by actually working with colleagues in psychology, in engineering, and so forth. I also had some funding track record. So I had PhD funding. Um, um, I had the Harry Ransom Center uh, fellowship, but nothing really major. Um, I certainly did have plenty of teaching experience, um, which I tried to leverage to my advantage in my applications. Um, so specifically for my Marie Curie um, application, and this is one of the things that I want to flag up briefly because my experience might be different from Anna's. I found out that being employed in teaching only contracts for more than 12 months actually counts as a research break for the European Commission. So just like parental leave. And so this makes you eligible to apply for the career restart panel, which is an interesting opportunity because it gives you three rather than two years of funding. So if you're thinking of applying for Marie Curie funding, do check whether you're eligible for the career restart panel. Um, I could also demonstrate services to the profession. So I had conference organization, uh, membership of executive committees of learned societies, some experience of public engagement and outreach. And finally, I had experience of working across several UK institutions. And I know that some funders are quite keen on um, ECR developing experiences in different universities. And I also had some international research experience. My degrees are from different countries and I had research, research stays in the States and in the Netherlands. 
Um, and international experience is really something that Marie Curie, fund, um, Marie Curie funders are particularly keen on because mobility is, of course, required, as we've heard from Anna. So um, a little bit more then about the process of applying for Wellcome Trust funding, which for me was really intertwined with the broader process of finding a way to fund the project I really wanted to develop, which is right in the sleep crisis. Um, so again, another timeline um, and uh, for this process and the four applications I did for writing the sleep crisis, a process that took about a year in total. Um, all the while I was, I was teaching full time at the University of Birmingham, so um, on a contract that didn't have time allocated for research or research applications. Um, so obviously it was a very busy and stressful year. Um, but I think that applying for different schemes, uh, which most likely a few of you will also do because you do want to maximize your chances of being awarded funding, uh, did help me write a successful funding bid. Um, it's not just a matter of feedback, and I will say a little bit more about feedback in a moment, uh, but actually going through different application forms forced me to look at the project from many different angles and consider issues within the project that I wouldn't have otherwise considered. So Welcome was for me the obvious choice for the project because Brighton the Sleep Crisis is a medical humanities project, so it fits perfectly within the remit of Welcome Trust funding. But my previous research projects are not in the area of medical humanities at all. Uh, my PhD was on the contemporary post-apocalyptic novel. Um, I did a fair bit of work on uh, representations of the Anthropocene. Um, so I was concerned, to be honest, <laughs> that my application for welcome um, would be unsuccessful because I wasn't a medical humanities researcher. I was wrong, and so I really want to stress this, um, because what welcome are after is a strong research idea in the field that they cover. So they want innovative research projects that, and I'm quoting from their website, will deliver shifts in understanding that could improve human life, health, and well-being. So of course, if you're a medical humanities researcher, that's perfect. Um, if you're not, but your project is in this area, do consider applying for Wellcome Trust funding, because what counts really is the idea, um, and that you're the right person to deliver that project. And of course, part of the application is to demonstrate that you're the right person for that project. So because I did have these initial concerns, I actually started with two other applications, which were both unsuccessful, a Liverium Expression of Interest and a STARS grant, which is um, an Italian grant that follows the structure of an ERC um, starting grant. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the ERC starting grant, but it's an incredibly long application that really asks you to think about your proposed research in quite a lot of detail. So while I was waiting for the results of the STARS grant, I started the application process for the Wellcome Trust um, Fellowship and soon after for the Marie Curie Fellowship. Um, something else that I briefly want to flag up about Marie Curie funding before I speak in more detail about the Wellcome application process um, is that many universities, especially in Europe, um, offer competitive Marie Curie masterclasses. Um, so you submit an expression of interest to an institution, um, generally something about your proposed project, and then if you're selected, you attend this masterclass, which is essentially a crash course um, in um, the Marie Curie application, um, which is particularly useful because, as Anna has talked about, this application is really specific, and especially for humanities researchers, as Anna was saying, it's quite tough to crack. So I really do recommend um, seeing whether um, you know, the institution that you're thinking of applying to with Marie Curie funding does offer a masterclass because it, is, it was very helpful for me. Um, so um, the Welcome Trust scheme I applied for had several stages, um, a preliminary application that I don't think um, exists anymore within the new scheme that they have. Um, but the, after the full application, basically, you received external peer review feedback and were then potentially shortlisted for interview. 
Um, so the step of receiving external peer review feedback and interview are very much intertwined in the sense that the questions that I was asked at interview uh, were mostly arising from comments and potential uh, shortcomings and issues highlighted by the peer review process. So my advice, if you're shortlisted for interview um, for the Wellcome Trust scheme, is to really spend a lot of time pouring over the peer review reports and preparing answers to questions that arise from that report. I had pages and pages of answers to the peer review comments. And I would also suggest you treat the interview a little bit like your Viva. Um, I didn't have a mock Viva and that was fine, but I did have a mock interview um, for, um, before my interview at Welcome. And it really did help build my confidence because this interview can feel quite intimidating. It's very different from interviews that you might have um, for um, academic posts. It's very short, uh, so you need to be able to give um, very concise answers to the questions. And the questions are often quite complicated because, again, they arise from uh, the peer review uh, reports. And there are quite a lot of people in the panel. If I remember correctly, because I kind of blanked my um, experience of the interview, there were at least 15 people um, in the room. So um, speaking of peer review, um, obviously part of the process of applying for postdoctoral funding is seeking feedback and receiving feedback. And I do recommend that um, before applying for any kind of funding, you obviously have quite a few people looking um, at your application and giving you feedback. In my case, there was quite a lot of feedback from different institutions and parties because, as I said, I was applying often for different schemes at the same time and at different institutions. And one of the top tips I give when it comes to feedback is that it's really important to sift through it. There will be lots of good constructive feedback, but there will also be some horrible comments and some only some of those comments will actually make any sense. So to give you a specific example, the first piece of external feedback I received on um, the Writing the Sleep Crisis project, uh, and this wasn't for welcome, um, started with the following sentence, the application is thoroughly unconvincing, um, which was obviously very horrible to read, um, but I gradually realized that a lot of th that peer review report was completely nonsensical. So I took on board what I could of that report and edited my application to other schemes to respond to some of the points raised by the report, but then proceeded to ignore the rest. Um, to conclude, I just wanted to leave you with a few thoughts um, on um, how to go about selecting the right institution and mentor. So I applied for my Wellcome Trust Fellowship with Northumbria University as a host institution. Um, this isn't an institution where I had worked before, but I did know my proposed mentor um, a bit because I had um, edited a special issue of a journal and I contributed a chapter to one of her edited collections. So I was comfortable with approaching her and asking if Northumbria would um, support my application. Um, the first thing to say is that really a good fit with your proposed institution and mentor is quite crucial. So of course you need to think about research clusters and centers where you'd be located and where you could be effectively supported in developing your project. Um, I'd really recommend mentioning specific people beyond your proposed mentor or supervisor. Um, so people whose research um, fits um, with uh, your project. But I also encourage you to think beyond the department um, or faculty where you might be based. Um, so Wellcome Trust funded projects are often quite interdisciplinary. So ask yourself if there are opportunities for cross faculty collaboration, um, which you could mention in your application. Uh, my research office was really helpful because they put me in touch with colleagues in psychology um, who were happy to support my application and with whom I now closely collaborate. And finally, don't just consider how you'll be developing as a researcher in that institution, but also how you'll be developing professionally more broadly and what you want out of this fellowship. Um, so in my case, I was really keen on developing a more public profile, so a more publicly engaged profile. So I selected a mentor who does a lot of work um, with impact and public engagement and was therefore um, able, the ideal choice really, for supporting me to achieve these kind of professional objectives. So my application to welcome really stressed um, this um, synergy between the work of my mentor and my proposed uh, professional objectives. 
Um, okay, so that's all from me um, for now. Thank you for listening. Hope it's been um, useful and I look forward to your questions. Yes, that was excellent. Thank you to Lafter. Um, next up, we have Katie Mishler, um, who is an Irish Research Council. Sorry, I'm just getting my screen up. Okay, there we are. Um, is an Irish Research Council Enterprise Partnership Postdoctoral Fellow at the Centre for Cultural Analytics at University College Dublin and Museum of Literature Ireland, Moley. Um, her project, Mapping Gothic Dublin, Historical and Literary Hauntings, 1820 to 1900, explores the development of Irish urban Gothic writing. And Katie will be talking about one of the um, Irish Research Council, or IRC, if you, if you hear to it referred to as IRC, that is the Irish Research Council's um, enterprise scheme, where you work with uh, an academic institution and a cultural institution, uh, I believe, but um, Katie will give us more details. So I'll pass over to you, Katie. Thank you. There we go. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. So I just need to share my screen. There we go. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Alison, for that wonderful introduction. My name is Dr. Katie Mishler, and I am an Irish Research Council Enterprise Partnership scheme postdoctoral fellow. I am based in the UCD Center for Cultural Analytics as well as Museum of Literature Ireland where I am also a curatorial assistant. So my talk today, first I'm going to give an overview of the Irish Research Council Enterprise Scheme Fellowship. It is a bit different than the other fellowships that have been discussed today in that it is primarily employment-based, which means you're primarily based in a non-academic institution as a researcher and you're working with them to further the aims of their organization primarily. I'll then go through the application process, which is quite similar to the other Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellowship. I'll give a little bit of a background on my project, the types of things I do at the Museum of Literature Ireland. And then I want to explore the reasons why someone might choose to do an employment-based postdoctoral fellowship, because it is a bit different than the other ones that have been discussed today. Then I will talk about how to prepare, how to kind of brainstorm a project that is employment-based before discussing how to not only find a mentor, but to find an enterprise partner, which is essential for the scheme. I also want to talk about skills development because the scheme is primarily interested in developing professional skills in researchers outside of academia. And then I want to talk about some of the challenges that I have encountered and that someone applying to the scheme may encounter, as well as some of the rewards and benefits of this particular scheme. So the Irish Research Council Enterprise Postdoctoral Fellowship, I just wanted to share some of the language from the actual website because there, it is a bit different than some of the other ones that are being discussed today. So one thing is that it is a national initiative that seeks to explicitly link researchers to enterprise. And you also do have support from a higher education institution, but you're primarily working with an enterprise partner. Um, and that means you're jointly funded not only by the Irish Research Council, but by the enterprise partner itself. itself. Okay. Um, so what is, sorry, my, okay, perfect. So what is an enterprise partner? Um, an enterprise partner, it can be a company, it can be a registered charity, it can be a social, cultural, or not-for-profit civic organization, a state-owned enterprise, or an eligible public body that will co-fund the researcher for the duration of the award. So depending on what field you work in and depending on what type of project you want to do, you could have any range of enterprise partners. I would imagine for a lot of people who are working in the arts and humanities, you would be looking at probably nonprofits or social cultural institutions, um, or you might be looking at galleries, you might be looking at publishers. Um, 
And if you are in humanities, you might be looking more at things like, or not humanities, social scientists, you might be looking more at um, civic organizations or at nonprofits or NGOs. But the important thing is that you're working with an outside institution that is not it can be affiliated with a higher education institution like Mali is a partnership between the National Library of Ireland and UCD, but it's not part of UCD. So you couldn't be working for an organization that is considered part of a university. And one of the other important things to kind of remember when you're considering applying for this is that this is a co-funded fellowship. That means two thirds of the funding that you receive is provided by the Irish Research Council. The other third is provided by your enterprise partner. The idea is then that the enterprise partner has a stake in this project, um, a financial stake that they're devoted to watching you develop. And it's supposed to be a project that does not only enable you to develop as a researcher and as a professional who can succeed outside of academia, but it is also designed to help strengthen enterprise partners as well. The application process is quite similar to the Irish Research Council postdoctoral application. It, um, it does change from year to year, I found. And I haven't included a timeline for the reason that it does tend to vary from year to year. My start date was actually the 1st of April 2020, and I believe I applied in, I think I applied in September 2019. Um, and I do think that they changed the application dates and the start dates. So if you are interested, I would have a look because I'm not exactly sure, um, but they do announce it once they are accepting applications. But the application consists of a research proposal, which includes a methodology, a timeline, a personal statement, your dissemination plans, but also a training and career development plan, which is two pages. This is the same to the Irish Research Council postdoctoral application, but it's important to remember that as this is an industry partnership and the primary aim of this is, is to help you develop outside of academia and give you an opportunity to develop a career outside of academia that you should be focusing on that in your career development plan as well. My project is called Mapping Gothic Dublin. I have a series of five writers that I'm looking at specifically how they their writing developed and how the um, urban writing of the Gothic era written in Ireland and taking place in Ireland develops during that time. But my outputs are primarily in conjunction with the Museum of Literature Ireland. So instead of them being, um, you know, necessarily doing just journal articles or just focusing on a book proposal, I'm working with them on disseminating it in public facing projects. So looking at things like podcasts, um, you know, tours, maps, these sorts of things that are aimed towards a public rather than academic or specialist audience. Uh, if any of you are based in Ireland or Dublin, or if you come to visit, I highly recommend you do visit the Museum of Literature Ireland. It opened in September or October 2019, so just six months before the pandemic. It is housed in UCD's Newman House. So again, it is a partnership between UCD and the NLI, but it's separate from it. It's a separate organization. Um, they have some really great programs. They have a young writers program. They have some excellent in-house exhibitions that deal with children's writing. They do a lot of things um, in the museum that focus on technology, focus on sound, focus on um, the different sensations we have when poetry is read to us or when we read poetry aloud as well. So it really is a new, exciting and innovative museum, which is what drew me to working there. I found that it was quite aligned with me and my interests and my specialization, but also that it was a place that I thought 
could give me a really great opportunity to develop my career professionally. So when you're preparing for the Irish Research Council Enterprise Partnership postdoctoral scheme, you do need to think through the methodology of the project. You need to think about um, the research questions. You need to think about how you're going to um, use your academic skills. But what is also really important, and I think this is before you approach a mentor, before you approach an enterprise partner, you need to think about what you want to get out of this partnership explicitly. Um, if the answer is an academic job, you may want to rethink the scheme, or you may want to think about how you think this could help you get an academic job. Um, but you really want to think about what you want to do. Do you want to work in arts administration? Do you want to work in an archive? I mean, this is like, think of your dream non-academic job. Do you want to work in a library? Do you want to um, work for an NGO? So I would start by thinking what you want to do. And I mean, think big, think dream job. You can find something that's manageable and aligned with that, but think, you know, don't be afraid to think kind of big in what you want. Um, and with that, where do you want to work? Where is the, your absolute dream job outside of academia? And with that, also think about though, what jobs match your skills? I know we've all gone to PhDs workshops where we talk about transferable skills that we get from the PhD, and we absolutely do. Um, you know, research skills, critical thinking skills, communication skills, um, not even to mention what skills you've gained from your specialization, looking at, for me, instance, Gothic writing and urban writing. Um, try to think about, you know, do you know anything about production, audio production, um, and try to think, okay, I have this skill set. Where can I go where I can develop this skill set and I can also use my skill set to enhance another organization? I would also try to think strategi strategically about the gaps there may be on your CV. Um, you know, doing a PhD is a four year commitment, four year, sometimes longer commitment, and you should never think about that as a gap, but also try to think, okay, if I want to go into the world outside of academia and I want to, um, let's say I, you want to work in grants administration, you know, you, you have a lot of skills that would contribute to grants administration. For instance, um, what I just mentioned, communication, obviously writing funding applications, um, you have insight into project management and project management in higher education and in academic research. But what can make you a really compelling competitive candidate for this type of job? And what experience could you have that could just really set you out as a candidate? Um, and with that, that goes with you know, the idea of trying to think about what experience and skills you need to develop professionally in order to get that dream job. Um, and another question would be, why should someone consider doing an employment-based fellowship? What are the benefits? Uh, one thing is developing new transferable skills and being able to have tangible outputs that demonstrate those skills that can also make you a very competitive candidate for a job. I know that doing the PhD, you, do, you have the thesis, you have articles, you have conferences, you have different um, activities you may have done like outreach, event organization. But again, trying to think, okay, what skills do I need and how can I demonstrate them to future employers? Uh, this includes building your CVs that can help you to transition to a post-academic career. I know plenty of people who have very successfully and happily transitioned to a career outside of academia without doing an employment-based fellowship, but I do think that doing an employment-based fellowship can be a particularly good way for you to build on those skills and help you work, particularly in fields that are quite competitive, such as arts management, uh, which I would say, or cultural management, which is quite competitive. That's something that can really help you doing that. Uh, one really nice thing about, uh, for me, that I found is that in this role, I am doing my own research, which I am then using for museum programming, 
But I get to work for the first time in ages, I get to work in a truly collaborative environment. And as you know, this has been quite helpful for me, I think particularly during COVID, where if I was doing a more traditional fellowship, I think being by myself, working on my own, working on my research by myself with only really having some colleagues and um, who are also early career researchers and my mentor to talk to and probably not talk to even every day. I now have 40 colleagues that I can talk to. Um, I'm currently very lucky. I'm based in Mali as we speak. And, you know, after this, I can go for a walk and I can walk down the corridor and I can bump into somebody and I can say, hey, I just did this really great talk. I have this really great opportunity to do. Let me tell you about it. Um, and I can share that with them. And even with times when I'm feeling quite stuck on something I'm working on, I can just pop next door to the office um, over there with masks, of course, we adhere to safety, but just say, hey, I'm really stuck on this. Can, can I just bounce an idea off you? Or can I talk to you for a minute and a half straight and try to get my head straight? That's something that I find to be quite helpful and quite a relief um, for me now. Another thing is it does have a nice structure. I do work nine to five now. And I think that has given me a bit of balance in my home life and my personal life before where I might work. Let's be honest, when you're doing a PhD, you can work 10 to 12, you know, then three to five, then seven to midnight. Okay, this helps me get that structure that I think I really thrive off of. Uh, and the other reason is it, it does give you an opportunity to develop as a professional and seek out other career opportunities. So in terms of the logistics with starting a mentor, uh, start early, okay? And I would, I would start emailing mentors, I don't know, I, I would say it would be good to have a mentor before the partner because then you have somebody on your side, on your team who you can talk to. If you are struggling to find a mentor, you have somebody, one, who can vouch for you, and two, somebody that can help you kind of think through any challenges you may encounter while finding a, a, a enterprise partner. Um, for me, I did my PhD at UCD, and for the year I applied, the IRC had waived the mo um, the mobility requirement, they previously said you had to go to a university that you had not been at previously. But this in this opportunity, I was able to stay at UCD, which I really did need to because Mali is a partnership between UCD and the NLI. So it would make sense for me to stay at UCD, even though I had been there already. So that was not a problem for me. You also want to look for somebody who has a good track record with PhDs or postdocs. I know somebody earlier uh, in the earlier session said, don't be afraid, you know, don't think you have to go towards senior academics. I think that's true. You may have a, I don't think you need to, but I do think it's a good idea to find someone who does have a good experience with PhDs and postdocs. Um, you know, I've done both where I've sent cold emails to people uh, who have responded and who have offered to be my mentor for various postdoctoral projects that I applied to and didn't get. Um, I was very lucky though that I already knew the person I was applying to and I already knew that we had a good repertoire and we could work together. So there was an advantage to that. Um, but another thing to really be thinking about is this is what you need to be a bit strategic with with this particular scheme is normally you need to think of when you're picking a mentor, you want somebody in your specialization. I needed somebody in my specialization, but also somebody who had skills and experience with digital humanities, which is something that could then guide my work at Molly. So you kind of need to not only think about research specialization and how that they can guide you and give you advice in your research queries that you may have, but also someone who can help your career development 
in skills that will help you excel outside of academia. Uh, and the other thing is keep asking. I, this was ages ago, I once emailed somebody, gave them a cold email, they never responded. Um, I waited, I followed up, they didn't respond. I eventually reached out to somebody else who was more than happy to work with me. So do keep that in mind. Now, with finding an enterprise partner, I would definitely say start early. Um, think about what, you know, I would make a dream list. What dream, you know, if, if you could pick anyone, who would you pick? You know, and again, thinking about that, what your dream job is. If you could work at any organization, what would it be? I would say it is, I'm extremely lucky because Molly is a dream to work for. Um, I've never worked in such a supportive, kind, calming, encouraging environment. I've been extremely lucky with all of my mentors throughout my academic career, but I've never, until working here, I've never worked in a place where I can say there's absolutely no toxicity, none. Um, whereas in academia, you will find plenty. And again, I don't mean any of my direct mentors or any of my direct colleagues, but you still find it. Whereas here, I've been so lucky for that. So I would also try to think about the culture of the organization and the culture of the type of organization where you want to work. You also want to make sure you're linking your skills to an organization's mission. Um, for instance, I know others who have done this scheme. You know, for me, I have specialization in literature. Molly is a museum of literature. It works really well. I know people who have had specialization or who've been studying, let's say, in sociology, and they've been focusing on LGBTQI plus identity, and they found a um, advocacy organization to work for. So find a way to link your specific skills and your specialization with a particular organization. But you also, in that, you also want to make sure you're proposing a project that can assist in their development. Uh, for me, I was very lucky that the project I pitched to Molly is really some, a subject that interests the curatorial team and the board as well. It's something that they're all quite interested in. So in that sense, I was able to pitch something that they said, okay, I can see how this would really fit in with our programming well, because this isn't just about you being developed. Remember, this is why there is this industry um, contribution that they have to make is because it's also about the organization's de development. Uh, and you need to treat this a bit like a job search and a bit like you are pitching yourself because essentially you are, you are asking an organization to invest time and money into you and your career development. With that, it is important to be upfront and realistic about the contribution. Um, I believe I said earlier it was 16,000. Uh, it can be possible for registered charities to receive a waiver for the first year, but for a lot of organizations, you know, that's still 16,000 euros. And that still can be quite a lot of money and take quite a bit of money out of small organizations budgets. So l talk to them about that, but don't be afraid. Don't let the contribution stop you from applying or seeking out partners. I think you just need to keep going, be prepared for no's, but keep emailing, keep brainstorming and keep asking. Um, before I approached Molly, I kind of had a different idea. This idea is much better. And I'm, I think this working with Molly has worked much better for me, but I do think I had emailed maybe two other organizations and I did not hear a response. So be prepared for that to happen. Be ready to adjust your plans and to move forward with it. Um, and in terms of my own experience, when I, before the postdoc, I was, uh, maybe a year and a half post PhD, I was doing a lot of teaching. I was lecturing, I was doing course administration, I was tutoring, I was teaching in the academic writing clinic, I was running seminars on academic skills development, I was teaching English as a foreign language over the summer. On average, it depended on the week, but I would have between 15 and 25 direct contact hours with students during that week, um, weekly. 
And that was a huge undertaking and took up a lot of my time. I also had about three different part-time editing gigs. I was an exam invigilator, uh, which entailed working from about six in the morning till seven in the evening. Um, and so I was basically just piecing together work, which was incredibly exhausting. Uh, I was incredibly burnt out. I didn't really have a huge amount of time to work on my own research because of this. Um, so I, I just couldn't continue to carry on piecing together all these different jobs. It was, it was really taking a toll on me mentally and socially. Uh, in terms of my research background, I had two peer-reviewed articles. I had a monograph proposal, which I had not yet submitted for review. I had received funding for both my PhD from the Irish Research Council and for my master's from Queen's University Belfast. And I had also attended a number of academic conferences. So that was before the postdoc. Um, I also had some experience working in arts administration in New York City, as well as higher education administration in New York City. And when I say I needed to address the gap, I mean, if you look at my CV, you see I kind of, I, I was not financially able to kind of go straight through. So I sort of needed to take breaks between each of my degrees. So you can see, you know, BA, working, MA, working, PhD. But to me, I didn't feel ready to apply for any job outside of academia because it had been so long since I'd worked outside of academia. So I had a gap that I needed to address. And now I think I'm not even, I'm 15 months into my postdoc and I already feel like I have loads of stuff I can put on my CV. Um, things like project management, um, production management, grant writing. I've done digital humanities work. I have extensive work in arts administration at a very new and cutting edge museum. I have curatorial experience. I have experience with educational programming. I also have lots of new contacts that I have developed through networking opportunities. Um, so I feel like my CV is looking much more robust and much more impressive than it was before I started this fellowship. Some of the challenges. One is that if you are in arts and humanities, um, you will feel a bit like a trailblazer. It's a relatively new scheme for arts, humanities, and social sciences. It's something that a lot of cultural institutions have not engaged in before. Um, and the reason I think it is a little bit difficult for people in arts and humanities to engage in the scheme is because of the contribution from the enterprise partner. So if let's say you have somebody working in computer science and they want to do a postdoc with Google, Google will have no problem giving up 32,000 euros, right, um, for two years. Whereas a very tiny arts organization will. So I think that's the reason why a lot of it, it is something that is relatively new for people from the arts and humanities. I applied to this not knowing anyone who had done this scheme before. And with that, um, because I was a trailblazer or felt like a trailblazer, I won't say, I won't, I won't call myself that, but because I felt like one um, and that I was charting, um, chartering new territory, there was very little guidance for me. Um, I didn't have anyone to really talk to. I did get some advice from UCB research, but most of their advice was geared towards people in the sciences because that's who they'd had succeed at the reward before. So I felt a little bit lost and on my own in that way. Um, a challenge is finding an appropriate partner institution because um, you, you are asking them to fund your research and to fund your work. And I would say that I would be concerned that finding partner institutions who can make this contribution will be particularly difficult for arts and cultural and other small organizations after COVID because a lot of them have taken a huge financial hit. So that is a particular challenge when it comes to the scheme. One thing I do know though is um, it could be quite helpful for you to already have an inside link. So if you have already done work with a 
library and you say, hey, I want to do this postdoc, I want to pitch this project, you can pay part of my current salary and you can put it towards this and my job responsibilities will change, but we'll have these outcomes. I do think that could really help your odds in um, finding a partner organization. I know some people who are doing PhDs on this scheme who have done that. Um, it also will, of course, give you an inside look and knowledge of the organization. Another thing is balancing tasks because this is industry based, um, it can and employment based. You have to switch gears quite a lot. So I find myself, you know, if I'm trying to research something for um, an exhibition, but then I have to have a meeting about something else, and then I have to have an in-person meeting about something else, and then I have to have a Zoom call with a stakeholder, and then I have 35 minutes to work on my research, and then I have to do a webinar. It gets really hard to switch between those tasks. And it can help if you say, okay, I have two days a week when I do my research, three days at the partner institution. Um, that does help, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way because you may be working on other things that can't be moved around your schedule. Um, so it can be difficult for you to find time to write and time to publish. Um, another thing is the coronavirus has really impacted our ability to work on site. So that's something that may cause a challenge. I did not get into Mali forever, um, which made my life very difficult. <laughs> in many ways. Um, and I was working with people I'd never met before. So there's some people that I met for the first time two months ago. Um, some of the people I'd met before, some of them I hadn't. Um, the fact is some of these smaller organizations might have difficulty finding a place for you to work on site, um, or you may not be able to work on site every day or those sorts of things. Um, so COVID has, I, I know things are more under control now. I started on April 1st, 2020, which is not an ideal time to be starting a postdoc. Um, you know, I think three weeks before that, Molly had closed. So that may not be a challenge for you, but it is something to think about if restrictions come back um, into place. However, there are loads of rewards. One thing I have is that I feel very lucky for is I have institutional resources. Um, Molly has recording equipment. Um, they have a website that I can put things on. Um, they have a mailing list. They have people who have memberships who take place in a monthly book club. Um, they already have structures in place that really help me develop my own programming. Um, they also have, you know, even just for me, having the name Molly attached to me. I feel like I've had to cold email some people with things, but, and I, I don't know how people would respond if I were asking, you know, for the same things from them. If I said, you know, I'm a researcher from UCD, as if I say I'm a curatorial assistant from Molly, but even just having that, um, I think has really helped me and helped me with this, develop this program and develop this project. It's really rewarding because I'm building a really impressive career network, not again, not just at Molly, but in working with other arts organizations in Dublin and in Ireland and even internationally on certain projects we're working on. So whereas before I think I had a really strong um, academic network and I still do, I didn't have, I had, I had a bit of a network in New York City from when I worked in arts administration there, but the one I have now is even stronger than the one I developed from working two years in an office in New York. Um, so that's a huge reward and can really, really help me develop professionally. Um, I also am very lucky because I feel like I have been able to put my research and critical thinking into practice and to creating tangible um, cultural products that people engage with, you know, um, journal articles are important and they're important. They're an important venue for you to share your knowledge and your research with the wider academic community. But I have a really cool opportunity to make things that will go in a museum. 
and that will educate people who may not have any background in academia whatsoever. And that's a really cool opportunity. Um, it can be very rewarding to feel like you have opportunities outside of academia and not just opportunities, but opportunities you can be quite excited about. Um, you know, I think it's important for us all to acknowledge that not everyone attending this talk today will get a full lectureship. Not everyone on these panels today will get a full lectureship. Academia is an incredibly competitive um, industry, if I can say that. And it's really exciting to know that I can have a, a good full life outside of that as well. Um, it's very rewarding if you feel like you're building a compelling CV that you feel ready and you feel prepared to enter the job market and also diversifying your professional experience. I think one thing that happens when you're doing the PhD is you can get so focused and kind of siloed in your interest and your abilities and in your skills that it can be really rewarding to say, hey, wait, I can do other things and I can enjoy them and I can find them rewarding. And I think in that sense, uh, doing an employment-based um, postdoc can be really genuinely rewarding. Um, that is all. Thank you guys so much for listening to me. Um, and please let me know if you have any questions. And I will stop sharing if I can. I can, there. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, we have loads of questions who have, that have been coming in. So, uh, Sophie, do you know how to get all the speakers back up on the screen? Um, not that it's not lovely looking at you, Katie, because it is. But they, they, have a they should all be back on the screen. No. Hmm. On my screen, I can just see. Uh, you might need to change your view. Okay, I've changed my view. If everyone else can see. Can everyone else see? Oh, fabulous. Oh, well, sorry. Sorry, just me. Um, okay, I've got a question from Luke. And he says, when showing you have applied for funding during the PhD, if you are funded by student bodies such as ESRC or the AHAC, AHRC, does securing funding from them for archival research slash conferences count as securing funding? Um, so would you list that as a kind of separate funding application because some of you that were funded letter you AHRC um you still have to apply for the funding for conferences so would you list that as a separate yes Anna were you you were an AHRC were you no um I had um an internal fees only award for my PhD um but I would say yes definitely if it's and if, if the funder allows you to continue to apply for other funding um and you're within you know, within your contract means then definitely just keep keep applying for what you want to do if there isn't enough funds available. Uh, fantastic. Hope that answers your question, Luke. We've got quite an international panel here uh, for this session. So not, I think I might be the only one that was AHRC funded unless Sophie might have been. Um, I've got a question here from Sheila and this also came up on Twitter. Um, she says, really heartened to hear the earlier speaker's acknowledgement of the fundamental inequalities of academia. Does anyone have any other reflections on how to practically combat the ways in which ECRs are encouraged to endlessly self-promote, um, sorry, to endlessly self-exploit and self-commodify and are therefore complicit in upholding a rotten system? Maybe more on being honest or realistic about what is actually achievable for a human being and not a robot. Um, I would like to address this really quickly just to say that I think, yes, ECRs do have there are things that ECRs can do, in, but I think events like this go a long way in being more honest about what's expected of us and sharing our rejections and talking about advice and strategies and absolutely demystifying the process. I saw a thread yesterday about the uh, Royal Historical Society's prizes and someone had noted that basically everyone had some sort of connection to Oxford or Cambridge and <laughs> none of the speakers that we've assembled, that I've assembled here today have any Oxbridge connections as far as I'm aware. None of us did any of our degrees at Oxbridge. And obviously we're all privileged in different ways, but there are ways in operating in the system without being the very, very, very privileged Oxbridge white man, um, independently wealthy model that we see we created everywhere. And I also think that it, uh, we're all precarious as well. And that 
uh, established members of staff can do more to help BCRs in some instances than they do, although lots are actively doing lots of brilliant things too. But I wondered if any of the other speakers had anything else uh, in response to this question. Just maybe only briefly, I really loved the letters slide that says it takes a while to sometimes come up with a good new project idea. And I think what we can do is in the narratives we spin in our cover letters and in our project proposals to not lean in to we're producing this according to ref timelines or whatever, but to tell an honest narrative about this is where I was at. This is what I've done so far. I have this brilliant idea and I want to do this because. And I think that goes a long way. Um, and I think by being honest to ourselves about that, I think that that's one thing we can do. Yeah, and I suppose, um, I mean, obviously, as I think Alison was saying, I mean, as individuals and precariously employed academics, I'm not entirely sure that we can do much about it. And that probably people in uh, employed in permanent positions have a much of much more power to do something about it. The only thing I can think of is to speak honestly to funders about how those eligibility criteria, especially if we've been awarded funding, how those eligibility criteria are really a problem. They do not take into account at all the reality of the academic job market. Um, and so that is something that I think we can do. Um. Katie, did you want to jump in there? You are, you yeah, know. one thing I think also that is important is to be honest with each other, because I feel like um, some of the, and, and I obviously to make sustainable change, it has to come from the top, like the ECRs cannot be the ones doing that work because we're doing enough work and we don't have the power and the um, ability to change these power structures the way somebody who is in a permanent position does have. But I think it's important that we're honest with each other about our struggles. Um, I see a lot of people in academia who spend a lot of time um, bragging about their accomplishments, bragging about how much they work, bragging about how they engage with um, this toxic work culture. And then I see other academics respond to that by saying, well, I'm not working that much. How am I going to get like kind of spiraling? So I think we need to be honest with each other and we need to be kind with each other. I think that's what we can do as a, you know, as a community of ECRs. Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. And you have, the three of you have all been so honest and so generous today in sharing all your insights, but also your rejections and your disappointments. And I think it's really important to, to open up about all those as well. I was chatting to a friend on the phone the other day about um, precarity, being precarious. And she said she pulled up her folder of rejections and she had about 40. I was like, only 40? God, I think I've got like 120 on the go at the minute. So um, this is something I always say, I, I have done really well getting fellowships, but in this kind of six years, I was post PhD, I got two interviews for permanent jobs and they were both in my first year post PhD. So I got nothing for five years when my CV was you know, much better than it was the first year out of my PhD. So you just, you just never really know what's going on with people, I think, as well. I um, have another question here, um, which we might be able to help with. Um, but with international postdocs, is Brexit a massive issue? Can we still apply for them? Does, does anyone know? I'm afraid I, I don't know. I know the ERC, or the European Commission, are still supporting applications from the UK. So I presume Anna Deletto, you might be more up to date with Marie Curie. I think that uh, you can, like yeah. in the sense that you just have to apply for another country though. So for instance, because I had been based for 10 years in the UK, my Marie Curie application was for Italy, which is paradoxically enough the country where I come from, but where I haven't lived for over 10 years. Um, so yes, you can, um, but you have to respect in the case of Marie Curie, the mobility requirement. And so you would need to apply with an international institution. Uh, Brilliant, thank you. Um, and a question here from Ramona, which is directed at you, Anna, although perhaps you also come in as well, Deletter. Um, she 
congratulations on your fantastic presentation, Anna. And then she says, thank you. And could you tell us a little bit about how your secondment fitted into the overall application and had your CV changed much between the first and second application? Um, so I answer the second question first because that's easier. No, the CV hadn't changed much. There was just about, um, from the time I heard I, it was a no that was in February and I reapplied in September, I was still um, in Germany. My fellowship at the Rachel Cost Center got extended. So I just had a longer stint at quite a prestigious research institute that probably helped. Um, but in terms of um, the monograph um, hadn't materialized, um, I did secure a special issue of a journal. So there might have been some movement on, the, on some publications on the CV, but overall not, not a dramatic shift. Um, how your secondment fitted into the overall application. So, um, as I think I've mentioned initially, I wanted to have like a non-academic secondment partner and I was in touch with the European, uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency in Ireland, as well as Fulcher Ireland, which is the tourism board. Um, it took them about a month, sometimes over a month to answer back to say really interesting project, but we currently don't have the capacity. Um, so unless you have already contacts with a non-academic partner, I think like um, cold emails, as Katie was also saying, can be quite difficult. Um, so this is why I think in hindsight, I, I would have had to kind of do something in advance to build up those relationships to make it feasible and workable. Um, not for all Marie Curie uh, applications do you need to name the secondment partner already in the application. You can hint you want to do a secondment. So um, you can develop that also later on, which is important to know, but obviously it bounce up the value of your application when you can say this has been agreed. Um, you know, you will have a mentor available if things are in place. So I then went with um, an academic partner, um, which is a university in the west of Ireland. So it is the region, it is an institution in the region of my case study with relevant archives. And my mentor would have been some, uh, is someone who is an expert in cultural geography. And that was a new area that I wanted to bring in and learn more about. So intellectually, it made sense in terms of the research um, and the archives, it made sense and to be in situ of my area of study as well. Uh, brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Deletta, did you want to come in on this? Um, I didn't apply for a secondment um, as part of the Marie Curie application. So I guess that that responds the next, the answers the next question about whether secondment is mandatory. So no. Um, it's not, I didn't have any secondment in mind. Uh, oh, thank you, Tata. Anna, did you want to come in on that? In terms of, it's not mandatory, is it? Um, but I would say, as someone who also had a Mary Curie, that having a secondment really improved your chances of getting the grant. Um, because, and exactly for the reasons that Katie outlined, they're also absolutely fantastic for you uh, to build skills in other areas. So if you'd like to, you can transition out of academia, you can get to work more creatively. Anna talked really well about this, about how Marie Curie really encourages creative application of your research and findings. Um, so I would encourage you to think about including us a comment if they, um, if they are putting together Marie Curie. Um, and also because as Katie was saying, it's a great way to get experience in different uh, workplaces, institutions, um, kind of uh, industries without, but you're still getting a, the great kind of pay that the Marie Curie uh, award gives you. So you, if some people might have to do this as an unpaid internship, it means that you don't have to do that. So you're still getting the financial support, which is so important when we're all precarious. Um, great, we have answered that one. Oh, next one from Tanya. I think, I hope I'm saying your name right, or Tanja. Um, when applying for multiple projects, uh, or funding at the same time with the same project, how much of the main project idea can be the same? Um, as in, I take that this doesn't work, like peer review, where you can submit journal articles to different, to different journals, same journal article to different journals, even though you might have similar reviewers or experts in the field that would evaluate your funding applications. Perhaps the latter, you might like to answer this first with, as you were submitting to at the same time. Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, you can absolutely submit um, the same project um, to different funding bodies and schemes. Um, obviously, you will need to tailor the project um, according to 
the specifics of the application form. Um, in my case, as I said, I applied with the same project to different institutions, so that also changed how I presented the project. Um, the only thing is that some funding bodies require you to disclose if you're applying for uh, different um, schemes as well. So uh, the welcome required uh, me to disclose that, so I did. Uh, Marie Curie does not, um, so I didn't basically. But so the only advice is, you know, if you're asked, if you're applying for other opportunities, then by all means, say that you are. But other than that, there is no issue in using the same project um, at the same time as many times that you want. <laughs> Did Katie or Anna want to say anything? Um, just perhaps um, I'm kind of, because I'm one way into the Marie Curie, I'm now applying for the next funding, which will be building on the Marie Curie. And this goes back, I suppose, to questions within the wider structures of the academy where some funders would say, oh, they won't fund something that is old. They want new and innovative ideas. So I've given it a different title um, and I've expanded it and kind of gave a different kind of sort of direction to it. Um, but at the core, it's the same idea. And some funding applications have, um, like you have a preliminary work uh, section where you can outline what you have already done. And the rationale I built into it was Marie Curie is my preliminary work. And then, you know, you go on from there. Um, for the sciences, that is perfectly fine, by the way. For the sciences, they can say, oh, I have all this data already assembled, um, and that will give them a great boost for their application. But yeah, for the humanities, not necessarily the same. Um, fantastic, thank you. Uh, just looking at a question from Lucia. Can anyone recommend where to search for visiting scholar and or teaching fellowships? Um, yeah, I mean, I can I can say how I came across them. So in terms of teaching fellowships um, on jobs.ac.uk, that's how I found my teaching fellowships. Maybe other people have different experiences. In terms of visiting scholar, um, yeah, pretty much the same, but also social media is really helpful in the sense that on Twitter you often find opportunities. Um, so for instance, I remember finding an opportunity in Australia. I wasn't successful, but through social media. Um, so I don't know whether anybody else has other kind of experiences. Uh, great. I have a question for you, uh, Katie. Um, what are the enterprise partners expectations from you? So what kinds of activities do you carry out and how do you turn your academic knowledge into a displayable or an applicable kind of knowledge? No, that's a great question. Um, thank you. Um, so I would say in general, with it, it, it doesn't say on your um, postdoctoral contract with the IRC, it doesn't say it's 70% employment based, 30% academic research. There's no requirement from the funding body to divide it in that way. So it really does depend on your relationship with your um, enterprise partner and what you're trying to accomplish with them or for them. Um, I will not name names, but I know somebody who got a PhD um, enterprise partnership fellowship to fund their PhD. And the partner said, great. Uh, so we want you to work nine to five, four days a week. That is not possible to do when you are also doing a PhD full time. Um, and in that case, the, the person ended up declining the offer because they couldn't be working. I don't know. What is that? 32 hours a week in this organization and be expected to then do their entire PhD research one day a week over the course of four years. It does not work that way. Um, so it really depends on your relationship. I have a very good, I'm very lucky. I have a very good relationship with my organization. Um, I, some weeks I'd say I do one day of work in Mali. Last week I did five days of work in Mali. It, it ebbs and it flows. It depends on what I'm working on and what needs to get done. Um, for me, I'm working on an exhibition on my research called Writing Gothic Dublin. 
Um, it will have both a online component. It'll be a digital exhibition. We're hoping there's been some setbacks, obviously, because of um, COVID. We're hoping there will also be an in the museum. We'll be able to incorporate it to some work in the museum as well. But um, you're basically, I'm, I'm working on an exhibition. So, and it is something where I guess with me, my specific, my specialist knowledge is Gothic literature. So this is kind of a, a really straightforward way for me to translate that into a product, which is essentially through museum curation. I, I know it's kind of crass to call it a product, but for lack of a better word. But, um, you know, try to think creatively, like there are other organizations where if they're not an arts organization, I'm sure there is a way that you can find a way to align your research with their goals. Thank you, Katie, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to collapse two questions together. Uh, one, some, these are both anonymous. Someone has asked, would the panelists have any tips as to how to figure out whether you'd like to work in academia or not? What might be the main differences between working in academia uh, and or elsewhere? Um, and then we have another question that says, at what point in receiving rejections for postdocs, et cetera, do you give up with academia? Just my first thought when reading the second question, um, at what point to give up is don't make it a waiting game. Have your own set of, have your own set of, you know, these are my priorities. When you're feeling you're increasingly getting unwell, um, you're feeling dissatisfied and everything stresses you out, you call the shots. No one is asking you to wait for eight, 10, 12, 15 years until you get a permanent post. Don't like take the control. Um, one thing I think it's really important to say is don't look at it like giving up. You're not giving up. You're not giving up on anything you're making and don't think that it's something that's outside of your control. You making a decision that's control. Like that's you deciding how you want to live your life. Um, and it's you making a conscious decision and saying, okay, this is not the life for me, you know, as Anna point out. Some people are willing to wait what could be 10 years. If you're not, that's okay. That's fine. Um, you know, and I, I do think that we have it I, I instilled in us that if we go through the PhD and if we don't come out with a, you know, lectureship at the end of it, we've somehow failed. That's not true. That is categorically untrue. And that is a very unhealthy, to toxic way of looking at it because one thing is then you're seeing it as a failure of yourself. You're saying that I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not clever enough. I'm not ambitious enough. It's a broken system, folks. Okay. It's a toxic system. It's a system that asks you to put your life on hold for many, many years. It's a system that asks you to be in your thirties and forties and be broke and to be unsettled and not be able to buy a home and not be able to start a family. Okay. That is not a way to live. Um, I personally, you know, it's also, I would think of what your values are. Um, I know some people who have gone straight into working after the PhD. Um, they own houses, they have kids, um, they work nine to five. They don't take their job home with them. They're not stressed out. Um, I'm sure sometimes they're overworked, but generally they have a very happy full life. Um, I have another friend who um, I did a postdoc for, it's in the sciences, so it's a little bit different, but I think she did a postdoc for maybe 10 years or so, and now has a job, her first non-academic job, where she is making over six figures. <laughs> and she is delighted. It is the first time in her life that she is not living like a student. Um, and she's it's not just about making a lot of money. It's about, you know, not having to decide between, you know, am I going to go to the pub with my friends or am I going to get a dental filling this month, um, which is a choice I've had to make before. Um, I did choose the dental filling, by the way, but it's, it's about having a comfortable life and never think about it as giving up. I would always think about it as what you want and what your priorities are and what your goals are.
Delata, did you want to come in on that? You were unmuted at one point. Yeah, I mean, I just completely agree with what has been said. Um, I think that it comes a point when you know that, you know, that's that you just don't want to go on. So for me, for instance, I had decided that if I didn't get funding for this project in that year, I would just give up. I had made that decision because it wasn't sustainable for me to keep um, working on, you know, uh, kind of piecemeal teaching fellowships and um, just con the constant anxiety of having to apply um, for short term jobs. Um, so I had basically made that decision. I was then fortunate enough to get funding, but I think that you know when it's enough for you. And I completely agree with what Katie was saying. It's not giving up, it's a choice. So. Great, thank you. I think we have time. Oh, just want to unmute themselves. So, Anna, did you want to? I just wanted to say that you haven't then you haven't lost anything out either so as Katie was saying that sense of it's not a failure you make an active choice and all the experiences that you've gained through it and the people you've met through it they're still stay in your life like there's things you know because some people sometimes say oh well I, I don't want to let go of something that I've invested this much time of my life into the investment is still there it just comes as a return in a different way yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we still have quite a few questions that we haven't been able to answer, unfortunately. Um, but I, Sophie Cooper is going to unmute herself and she has a suggestion for you all. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say that a lot of people, have, well, a few people have been asking about networking and how you kind of build up these different networks. Um, I think Twitter is a brilliant way and obviously it doesn't fit to everyone um, and you should be doing everything else as well. But if you would like um, to use the hashtag, so ECR Day 2021, to uh, potentially introduce yourself on Twitter and maybe introduce your own work um, and kind of reach out to other ECRs um, or the speakers that way, please feel free to use the hashtag in that way. Thank you, Sophie. I think that's such a brilliant suggestion, especially as we got asked in the last panel about how to network in times of COVID. Also, Twitter is great if you are a bit shy. <laughs> I've always used it. It's great for conferences because you do feel a bit like a creep. You know, you approach someone and you say, I think I follow you on Twitter. But it is a really good icebreaker and it is a really good way of, of meeting people. And I've met people that I've collaborated with on Twitter too. Um, so that's the end. That concludes this session. We've got another session after lunch starting at two o'clock on the Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellowships. So same funder as Katie, but a different scheme. But we actually have another Katie talking about the Irish Research Council, just to confuse everyone. Um, and then the Lee King Trust and the British Academy. So you'll have to go back to your Eventbrite email to get the right Zoom link for that panel, which starts at two. Um, but all that remains for me to do is thank you so much again to Katie, Anna and Delata for this incredibly informative um, presentations and really honest discussions about the challenges that are facing us all in our precarious early career lives and thanks also to Sophie for the tech support as always. Um, so hope to see lots of you after lunch um, and thanks again to our speakers.